looks like it's from the North Pole or Antarctica. Okay, uh, we we have a couple, or I have a couple of announcements for your benefit uh, before we get started with today's slides. And I will tell you, I hope a few more people will join us because the first slide, we kind of skipped past it because there wasn't a lot of time on Wednesday when I was recording from Santa Rosa, right? Uh, to, to give uh, proper attention, it's called the wedding portrait. And it's so well known that I think almost all of you will recognize it, but it's greatly misunderstood the meaning of some of the details. So uh, let me do this. I'm going to go ahead and do the speaker view. And the reason is I'm going to hold up some things that you guys uh, Okay, we got another person to admit. Timing. Yeah. Okay, welcome, Justine. We're just getting started. I have some announcements that are for your benefit. The first one may seem like, oh, well, this is an art class, not a night class. So I'm not going to get partisan. That's not appropriate. But I think it is important to mention today is the deadline to register to vote in this year's um, you know, recall. Whatever, I'm not getting specific, but whatever your opinions are, it does matter. I mean, if you care, for instance, about minimum wage being maintained and whether school districts or, or businesses should or shouldn't have the right for mass mandates, vaccine mandates or not. Oh, don't mess it up. I need. Oh, we got like to the turn your microphone off. And then lastly, there's another issue that this election could determine, and it's on September 14th. So if you register by midnight online, my daughter did that. It's easy. Uh, you'll get a ballot in time to send it back. It has to be postmarked by the 14th. Uh, and of course, what you choose to do is your business on that ballot. Uh, but there's even, you know, a possible impact on women's rights to file complaints about sexual harassment. Uh, I'm not going to get specific, but if you don't know what I'm talking about, pay attention and listen to the different candidates that are vying to replace uh, Newsom and make up your own mind. But you won't have a voice if you don't register, if you haven't already, by midnight tonight. Okay, end of, uh, you know, civic announcement. Now we're specifically looking at uh, today's uh, session. We're going to cover how to write the papers. You, you'll be pretty clear by the end of this session uh, how to, uh, you know, your papers, how they should look and what to expect when you turn them in. I will have a cover sheet, but I'm not going to send that now because you'll just that'll just get lost in the ozone. I know that. I will send it the week before the papers do. It's one page. You all should have gotten the two handouts that I sent as uh, PDFs. One was the five requirements. We're going to go over that together in just a couple minutes, and you'll ask uh, have a chance. I mean, to ask any questions that you would like to to know about. Uh, the other thing. Uh, we're going to do is I will briefly hold up to the screen a sample paper. You should already have seen it and printed it out, but you don't have to if you don't want to, but it's an A paper from exactly the same requirements as, as this, this paper, except it was a hard copy back in the ancient times when we could all teach face to face and students could safely come to a class in person. So uh, the point is that that is something you can use if you want to print it out as, a, as, a, as you know, a, an example or template for you to follow while you're working on your own paper. I will briefly hold that. I'm not going to read it to you because you can do that on your own, but you'll see why it earned an A and how those points were uh, achieved by that student to get that grade of an A. Before we get to that, one more house, last time now, house cleaning thing. I sent everybody an email, it's probably my third. I, I won't be doing it again because I need to focus on other things, such as I'm going to be out of town for five days. I don't know if I'll have reception. I'm going to a small town, Clarkston, you know where it is up in Washington, where my wife's family has planned the first reunion in over two years. We haven't been outside California, like most of you probably since bef well before the pandemic. So... I may or may not be able to get your emails. Go ahead and send them in. But voicemails are more reliable for me because I know there's phone service up there. I've never brought my laptop on these outings because they were, you know, just it wasn't that urgent. It was always in the summer anyway. We're in the middle of fall semester, so I will bring my laptop with me, but I don't know if I'll have any service or it'll be spotty or what have you. I'm not giving a class that, you know, it's a holiday, right? So you don't have to worry about missing any of the uh, scheduled lectures. Obviously, Monday, everyone knows no class of any kind for any of you in any college. It's a national holiday. So don't wonder if you 
why you didn't get a Zoom invitation. So we won't see each other for after Wednesday. Of course, I'll see you Wednesday uh, to finish up uh, High Renaissance Art, which we'll get started on today. Uh, we, we will then have perhaps the way you guys, we may have to wait till the week after I get back for me to download and post on YouTube the videos from this week. Again, because I can't do that till after, you know, I've got all of them recorded and I do them back to back so I don't have to go back and forth and I'll be up there where I don't know if there'll be reception. If there is, I will send you an email saying I just posted, uh, you know, for each class, right? The, the video of the lecture from week three. If not, it'll just have to wait till next week. I'm sure you guys can handle that since there's no deadlines at this point. Your papers aren't due for three more weeks. Keep in mind though, you don't wanna uh, make your first paper late if you can help it, you have that option, but it usually affects your final grade because then you get backlogged or backed up with other classes and then the midterm and the second paper in this class. So best to get it done on time if you can. We'll get to the papers in a minute, here we go. I still have eight people that are on the roster. I just reprinted it that have not been dropped by the you know administration for some reason. That's a new category, admin drop. That's, I don't do that. But I have to drop anyone that I haven't heard from next Tuesday. So that's a deadline for mini bios if a handful of you haven't yet gotten. Oh, hang on, hang on, admit. Uh, Jimmy, yeah, we're just, just doing a quick, yeah, uh, sort of overview of, we're gonna to get to this, uh, the topic of today. The first part is about how to write your papers. But anyway, here are the names. I'll read them quickly one last time. If you hear your name, it means something. For whatever reason, I didn't see a mini bio from you and you'd need to send it to me uh, by um, the end of this week really would be best. So I can log them in when I get back at like midnight. <laughs> you ever driven all the way from Western Washington back to the Bay Area one day? <laughs> On Labor Day, I'll be back. And then Tuesday, I'll have to check all my, you know, inbox and see if uh, if I have any of these remaining or missing. Okay, uh, mini bios. Fernanda Barajas, uh, Jacob Dowling, Jason Jones, there's only eight, I think. Uh, Colton Miller, Margot Pierce, Jessica Rosales, Angelina Solano, and then I think it's just one more, Taylor Wimberly. Uh, but I do have uh, a new student, Alexander, I don't know if he's here, uh, Vyazotsev, I think I said that right. It's, I assume it's a Russian surname. My daughter's from Russia, I think I told you that we adopted her. Anyway, and you, Alexander, if you're hearing or if you see the, the <laughs> recording of this, uh, what I ask is you to write three uh, things about your experiences in art, uh, I mean, sorry, your educational experiences and uh, work experiences. Second would be uh, where you've uh, lived and traveled and finally what you want to learn from this class. And it's just like a half page. Okay, so if you heard your name called, you just can assume, I, I don't know what the reasons could be that might've gotten spammed out or sent to the wrong address. If you didn't send it, you need to write it and send it. If you did, resend it, please in the next three or four days. Okay, uh, let's see. I think there is one more announcement here. Actually, uh, no, no, there isn't. All right, let's hold up here. I'm gonna now hold up the five requirements that you all should have out in front of you for those who, unless you join the class late, but even then you should have gotten this because I sent it out, I think it was Saturday. If anyone was enrolled by Saturday, you should have this. And you should have this with you when you write your papers. Um, okay, let's do them one by one. It's all written out, so I think they're self-explanatory, but some of these bear a little more explanation, and so I'll be happy to. Is there? Oh, okay. Is there one more? Okay, I thought there was one more person waiting to be admitted. All right, so let's uh, go through these one by one. You must have at least one full page each on both the meaning and the formal analysis. Please keep these sections separate and label them. Otherwise, it can get confusing for me or the readers to know what you're talking about if you mix the meaning and the formal analysis in the same paragraph or same section. So it's two separate sections. It should be easy, just you know, label the way we've been doing, or sh you should have been doing your notes in, in each slide lecture that you've taken notes in. Um, and when I say one full page, that's 23 typed lines. Uh, 
12 point typeface is pretty standard, I think, right? For every college class I've ever taught or um, for that matter, uh, the ones of my colleagues have taught. I don't think there's too much variation. Uh, you know, of course, double space, so I can see, uh, you know, more clearly. <laughs> my, you know, comments can also be written in the margin or between lines if you're missing something, or I want to con. And I do both, compliment or say good. That's if you have, you know, anything missing or something unusual in your paper. Usually, the summary is at the end as to what you did well or what you might have missed in a single sentence or two that I or the readers will do at the bottom of the uh, page, of the last page, I mean, of the paper. But it, the point is it needs to be 23 double spaced uh, typed lines, 12 point typeface. That's a full page by any definition of college, uh, you know, uh, manuscript requirements. Uh, okay, then the next thing is that, uh, any questions about that? Well, actually there could be one. I know some people will get really, you know, eloquent about uh, the, uh, let's say the meaning. They go on for a page and a half, but then they look up and they say, oh, the paper's due tomorrow. And so they only do half a page on the formal analysis. Well, you just dropped at least a grade there because you can't do a full thorough job of all nine elements and, and explain them, you know, with examples. Remember the requirement is two examples or more for each of the nine elements that you see in the work you're writing about, right? So in order to do that, it does take at least a full page. I can tell you from experience, almost all the A papers have been three to five pages. Please don't give me 10, that's too long. <laughs> seven is even excessive, but maybe in that range, somewhere between two and seven, but the requirement is just two to five. And usually you'll find you're somewhere in that range if you covered everything properly. Okay, so in other words, if you, dro if you drop the requirement, you know, if you could give me a three page paper that's over two pages, two and a half on meaning, and then just half a page on formal elements or the reverse, you've lost a couple of, well, a grade at least, because it, obviously you're not meeting that requirement, but also lengthwise, you clearly wouldn't be able to do a thorough job uh, of either the meaning or the formal analysis in less than a page. Just from experience, I can uh, guarantee that's true. Okay. If you have questions, stop at any point as we go. Okay, so that's pretty straightforward, right? Number one, okay. All right. Number two, here's one also that people try to sometimes finesse. And I've seen every kind of combination. Number two, papers must be a minimum of two full pages in length and a maximum of seven pages. See, I told you that would be, you know, if you give me eight, I'm, you're not going to get marked down, but, you know, you don't need to do that for yourself. You can give yourself more free time to do other things as well as being kind to your readers. <laughs> please keep, uh, I'm sorry, I'm, I jumped the line here. Okay, uh, please remember, here it is right there. A double spade, 12 point typeface, right? 23 uh, lines. Uh, anything less will, will result in a loss of points. What do I mean by that? Well, if you start your paper down about line six, because you do a, a large bold or whatever, uh, all caps title, it's, and then you put your name in the class, that's nice, but it's not a full page. <laughs> So if you do that and then end on that page, that first section, let's say it's a meaning, and then you do a full page on form analysis or a little more, good on that section, not so good on the first part. Obviously, it's easy to do a line count. And so usually we don't have to. It's obvious at a glance, me or the readers can tell you know, pretty quickly uh, if, you, if you were under uh, that minimum of 23 lines typed on either half. It's pretty straightforward, I think, and, and pretty easy to adhere to that. Again, any questions from anybody about the first two elements or uh, requirements, I mean. Okay, now illustrations also should be pretty straightforward. Um, they should be at least four by six inches. You know, obviously that's, you know, in your digital file that you're gonna send me, uh, at least a half page. The small ones, we can't see the detail to tell, did you get correctly analyzed, you know, every element. If it's, and also they must be sharp, not fuzzy. Cause you, again, you can't tell if you were correct in your analysis of the, say uh, the uh, simulated texture, right? Or the modeling, if it's too, too uh, soft focus, it should be sharp, the image. And in color, if you give me a black and white image of a color work of art, you automatically will lose several points off the, right off the top before I start grading. So what about an original work in black and white? Easy, just say that. You'd say that in the body of your paper when you come to color, because then you're gonna say it's neutral, right? Black and white is not either warm or cool. We covered that last week. 
Oh, by the way, yeah, I did have one other announcement. Uh, those of you who were so helpful as to point out that uh, that first session, well, actually, I don't know if anyone did, a week ago, the one a week ago today would be last Monday, the first one for week two on the formal elements. For this class, it didn't record. I know I hit record, but I probably didn't. I don't know. Whatever the reason is, the exact same lecture with information exactly that you need to understand those nine elements is now on YouTube. I, I sent everybody an email, but I understand not everybody reads emails. In this class, it's important to keep up with those at least twice a week. Maybe, you know, every other day, check your inbox, at least during weekdays, because I do try to keep you up to speed on what's happening with things like that. So if you say, oh, where's uh oh, what happened? I, I can't find the, you know, week two, uh, first half of the class from that date, whatever week ago Monday was, is, is 23rd. Yeah. Uh, so, you, you know, how do I do the nine elements or understand them? Well, just go to the, it's on YouTube. Anyone can access any video on YouTube, right? I think there's no limitations that I know of, at least not with this kind of video. And just log on to that one or just, you know, play it. And the first half, you don't want to waste time listening to the other part about ancient art because this isn't an ancient art class. So it'd be just the first, you know, an hour, an hour and 10 minutes. And then you've got the exact same information. It's under week two, our 2.1, the nine elements it's labeled. Okay. And I gave that same lecture that night. So it's the same date. I already said this in email in case you didn't catch that. Okay. So let's move on with the uh, requirements. I think it's pretty straightforward, the illustrations, but the next two are where people make more often make mistakes on their first paper and lose points than any of the other requirements. Okay, number four, bibliography. Okay, a bibliography must include at least three new sources, meaning you could use Stockstead and Guild, but if you meet this requirement, that would mean you'd have five sources. In other words, if you want to cite them, you can, but they're a given, you should have, I mean, they're a required text. So we, we do ask in all the art history class I ever taught or took, you know, that you do new research. It is a short research paper, okay? So at least one of these sources must be printed. Now this, I obviously have to modify. That means that you can find, like, let's take Encyclopedia Britannica. I think some of you know this. It's a pretty, I think it's the only company in the world is out of Britain, I believe. Well, that's the name Britannica, uh, but it's, it's, you know, used all over the world and it's a reliable source. And they've done, you know, online editions of their printed, originally printed um, volumes. That counts. So in other words, if it was originally a printed source, say that, and of course, is you going to access it online? I understand that. So then you would give the, you know, the URL and say, from original or from a printed source. And it doesn't have to be encyclopedia. It could be anything like a magazine. Most magazines do both. I write for the Marin, uh, Marin Magazine. I think I told you I got a, an article that you get extra credit if you choose to download and or let alone actually get a hard copy, even more points. It'll come out in November. I just got the editors, which means October, the November issue. And it's about the Miwok culture. Well, we're gonna cover that in this class. It's a new unit I just created. The people were here before any Europeans arrived, right? For thousands of years. Okay, so on that kind of a thing, if you used an article about, you know, whatever you saw from any magazine, they're mostly now, well, a large percentage of them are both online and in print. So that counts as a printed source, originally a printed source. That's all you have to say in parentheses. Uh, okay, so three new sources. And of course, you need to give the URL, the full URL, not just Wikipedia. It's okay to use Wikipedia. I hear uh, some of my students tell me they've had professors at the JC or other colleges say, oh, you can't use Wikipedia. I don't really agree with that anymore. I did for a while. When Wikipedia was first started out, it wasn't a reliable source, but we'll, I'll get to why that has changed in a minute. It's okay to use Wikipedia, but not for all three of your news sources. <laughs> just you know, maybe two new articles out of Wikipedia and one somewhere else that was originally a printed source. That would cover your requirement on number four, okay? Obviously, uh, newspapers almost all have both. Print. Well, some of them are now only online. <laughs> They're barely hanging on, the smaller ones. But the major metropolitan newspapers, San Francisco, oh, well, not open anymore, Santa Rosa. You have a very good paper up here. I've written for it many times, the Press Democrat. You might find something in there relating to the topic you're writing about in your paper. Uh, then you can, that would be covering, you know, one of the new sources that was originally print, okay? Now, what about non-print uh, uh, sources? Can anybody think of a source that has nothing to do with either, you know, a posted article on the internet, 
whether it was ever originally in print or not, or, or some kind of printed uh, material. Any other sources that you can think of for researching an article on art on a particular artist? Anybody? This is important because it could help a lot of you, uh, you know, broaden your perspective as well as meet your requirements and, and you know, really learn more about that work of art of that artist. Anybody think of any other sources? Uh, Florence, you look like you're thinking about it. <laughs> well, okay, let's say that the artist is still alive. Because some of you are going to write about, I know that's exciting because the artist is still somewhere. So, you know, everyone knows, oh, well, an artist with any success is going to be findable, right? I mean, they're going to have their own website. So how, what would you do then? Just go to their website or could you do one more step and then really, you know, get a lot, you, you, that way you'd even have two new sources. Okay, interviewing the artist. <laughs> online, by phone, probably not in person in this day and age, is a great way to meet one of the three new source requirements. Another one is a museum. Yeah, museums are open now. I, I told you I've been to a couple since uh, mid-summer. And so if you go to, uh, hang on, there we go. We're covering the, the uh, five requirements for uh, short papers. So since we've already done the first three, if you want to put down the page, page of the handout, five requirements go to number four. We're talking about uh, re requiring new sources. Another one is a documentary. That's an easy one, right? And that could be obviously now streaming. What else would it be? Well, maybe you rent the DVD off Netflix. Yeah, I still do that <laughs> and have it delivered to your house. <laughs> Whatever. It doesn't matter if it's a documentary about that artist, that period of art or that, that uh, culture that the art came from. It qualifies as a very good news source. And then you would list the doc, you know, the information about the title of the documentary, who made it, and if there's an author, and the year, right? In a bibliography. Now, if you have questions about how to cite sources, here's a good way to go. Noodle Bib, or now it's called Noodle Tools. I think they changed it slightly. Noodle Tools is out of every library, including the two libraries uh, at the JC, both the Santa Rosa and Petaluma campus sites for how to cite sources, they can help you uh, with, with, you know, online advice on I, how do I correctly cite, you know, a documentary, for instance. Well, I just told you, but not everyone's going to hear this or remember, right? You only have to get the title of the documentary, who produced it, what, you know, entity, company, or BBC, or PBS, or whatever. Uh, and then if there's an author, someone who wrote it or narrated it, then that would be the name of the right person, full name, and, and the year. That's good enough. And now if it was broadcast, you might want to write the, 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 the date that it was broadcast uh, or that you accessed it. That's, that's optional. But with a documentary, you get a lot of information, sometimes a lot more that way than you do from a website about that artist. So that's another source. And then museum brochures. I didn't finish that point. The museums almost always have a brochure on their uh, new exhibits. Now on their existing exhibits, it's what's on the wall. Right, a plaque next to the painting or the sculpture, whatever it is you might choose to write about in some Bay Area museum. Uh, that's a legitimate source, but you'd need to cite that with the museum, the day you were there, you know, and uh, <clears throat> what, what the, the uh, format was, whether it was, you know, museum notes, wall notes or something, or plaque or whatever they call it. And you have some flexibility in that. But anyway, that gives you some, hopefully some original uh, ideas for sources. Okay, let's see now. Any questions about bibliographies? Oh yeah, you do need to label it bibliography and it should be at the end of your paper always. That's a standard format for a research paper. Okay, any questions about number four or anything we just covered? I'm gonna take a second, <laughs> have a swig of coffee here. One of the few advantages of <clears throat> Zoom teaching. Uh, we got, hi. Good timing. We're just going over the five requirements uh, for your papers. We, we're just finishing up number four, so you can watch the parts you missed. Uh, all right. So nobody has any questions about that. There, there is a site. I'm pretty sure. Can someone maybe some can confirm this? Has anyone tried in the last, say, few months since you know spring semester or summer or early on in this fall semester in any class to look up uh, how to write a uh, site, I mean, how, how to cite the sources you might use in a research paper on noodlebib, it's N-O-O-D-L-E-B-I-B.com. I think it's still a website, isn't it? 
It was the last time I checked, but that was late spring semester. Well, in any case, the library source is called Noodle Tools. And they are a fairly, if I can do it, you can do it, fairly user-friendly library website for your two SRJC library branches. And then they have a research librarian on do it, at least they're supposed to, who can answer your questions if you ask specifically, clearly, how do I cite this source or not? Okay, so now here's the part where the most confusion occurs. Yes. Yeah, thank you, uh, Florence, that's helpful because yeah, I, I remember it didn't, of course, exist when I started teaching here. Well, maybe it did in the 90s. Anyway, uh, but but I remember when I found out about it, all my students who used it said it really helped and almost all of them did better on their papers uh, than they would have otherwise. Yeah, uh, both because of the information and because they knew they got the bibliography right. Okay, number five. You must cite, this is a minimal requirement, you must cite at least two sources from your bibliography within the text of your paper, either with standard footnotes, you all should know how to do footnotes, I know my daughter was doing them, I think even by uh, fifth grade, well, certainly middle school and all the way through high school, and she's going to be doing them again for classes she's taking online at the JC, at this JC, <clears throat> uh, Zoom, of course. Anyway, the point is that you should all know how to do footnotes, but that's cumbersome and time consuming. We give you a break in this class and a few other artistic classes, where if you want to do a simpler uh, a citation within the body of the text, um, you could then, let's say you used um, one of the art history texts, a new one. Gardner's History of Art is pretty good, by the way. And so is, uh, let's see, Jansen. That used to be the required text at this JC, but it wasn't very inclusive. So I agreed. We, we had a vote that was you know, almost unanimous. It dropped it and decided to take Stockstead because her textbooks have always been more inclusive. So anyway, so let's say you chose someone like Gardner's History of Art, which is a good one still in print. Um, you could just put the last name of the author, spelled correctly, comma, and the page number from which you got that fact. Now, when do you cite something in the, this called uh, in-text citations? or footnotes, there, there are two, of the, two ways to accomplish the same thing. Anytime you have a quote, you should do that. Anytime you have a quote. And anytime you have a fact that you don't already know, but we're giving you a real break on this one, which is a minimum of two, at least, of those new sources that are in your bibliography should be cited either as footnotes or in-text citation. So what if it was a, um, a website? Well, I gave you an example, this is, you know, one that's quite commonly cited. I see it in lots of papers. People write anything about Michelangelo's artwork. They often find Wikipedia. Well, then you don't just say Wikipedia. <laughs> How many millions of articles are there? You would write the whole, uh, right, wikipedia.com. And if you want to do the URL, www. But you could just say wikipedia.com, comma. And the title of the exact article you got that fact or quote from. You only are required to do two students are more diligent and used to doing this kind of research, which I include, would assume includes almost everyone in, in this class and my other classes, would, would find it probably reasonable to do three or four. But we don't require you to do that for every single fact. In other words, if you have a paragraph full of facts about an artist's life, I mean, how many people know that Michelangelo was born in 1475 and died in 1564? I've been teaching so long. It, <laughs> It's stuck in my head. He almost made it to 90, but just short of his 90. That's very, I mean, now that's a long life. Back then, it was really unusual to live that long. Still creating new artwork right before he died. Pretty remarkable. Okay, so that's, that's a fact you might put in the body of your paper under meaning when you write about the artist's life, right? Well, you wouldn't know that normally, so you ought to cite it. But if the paragraph is full of facts like that, you could wait to the bottom of the paragraph and mention what book or website or whatever article or documentary you use for those facts. We're gonna be very flexible, but if you, if you just give me one source or you incorrectly cite them in the text, which is a pretty simple requirement, you know, with in the parentheses and the URL with the title of the article or the last name, if it's a printed source of the author and a page number, that's pretty reasonable. And if you don't do that, you lose some points. And if you did, did that, you know, 
uh, it didn't, I mean, do it at all, you'd be dropping a whole grade before, because this is a reasonable requirement, I think. I'm gonna mention something about Wikipedia real quick. I don't think most of you know this, uh, maybe some of you are using Wikipedia when it was still new, what is it, 15 years old now, something like that. Uh, about five years ago, that's why I think it's around that old, uh, they had their anniversary, 10th anniversary, and the, and the founder, I forget his name, the founder of Wikipedia, I, I like this fact that he was, uh, you know, upfront and honest about the early days of Wikipedia when it wasn't reliable. Why? Because any, anybody could post, as some of you may remember, if you were doing papers that far back in the early aughts, anything they wanted about any subject with no references. Oh, no, I would never allow Wikipedia back then. I do now because he got sued. The website, the author of one of those articles and the founder for multi-millions of dollars and they were found liable for $10 million judgment. Remember, this is like, you know, 15 or so years ago. So it's more like 15 or 20 million today. Why? Because an article without any vetting or any sources about the assassination of President Kennedy written by a disgruntled employee who was fired from the speech writing team. You know, I have ever seen videos of Kennedy. He was eloquent, but of course that was because of speech writers and his delivery. So his head speech writer was the one who was cited in this phony article made up of false accusations with no evidence that he was involved in the plot to kill. Would they have been childhood friends? It, it was ludicrous. It should never have been published on a reputable website. Well, once it was, um, Ted Sorensen was his name. Uh, he he went on uh, you know, TV and mentioned it, and then he filed a lawsuit, and he won, as well he should have. And the founder of Wikipedia, to his credit, learned a lesson from that. He said, from now on, all our articles are going to be verified. And you know that. If you scroll to the bottom, they're some of them very thoroughly uh, right uh, sourced and, and decided their sources at the bottom as uh, endnotes, they call that, if they're not in the body of the text, right? So now it's a reliable website. Um, so that's just one example. And also just using uh, websites is not a good idea. I already said you should use at least one that had originally been a print source, even if it's now something you got obviously off the internet. Okay, um, I think that's pretty clear all, uh, I mean, pretty clear about each of the five elements. Oh, yes. Um, when you do, I do have one more thing. When you do finally get your paper ready to submit, uh, this is the way you should label it. Now, obviously I put a little X there. You see our, this is our 1.2 short paper number one. See, I did this for both my uh, papers. It should be labeled this way. If you don't do that, I may not be able to log it in properly or it may get mixed up or even just lost in the shuffle and you may not get it graded with the others. You don't want that if you put a lot of work into a paper. So please, everybody, I'm going to hold this up for another minute. You can take a screenshot or write this down or otherwise replay this part of this class video before you turn your paper and make sure you write it this way. Art 1.2 short paper number one, underline last name, first name, because I only have one, one section this semester of 1.2, that works. My uh, 2.1 class, I have two sections and for them, they're gonna have to do a little more than this or else their work will get mixed up. Well, actually, what am I thinking? I have an in-person section, they're gonna turn theirs in hard copies, uh, old style, right? So I'll hold up one more time. That's really important. And also that has to be a PDF to markw at aol.com. The, the Outlook website is just so cumbersome and every day I get so much junk, much worse, believe it or not, than maybe it's my filter or something on AOL. I get a lot less junk mail, A and B, it's easier to navigate. So, and it also is easier to forward back and forth between me, the readers, back to you, you know, your grades, much easier as long as you label them this way. So again, the requirement is to have the a paper converted to a PDF along with the cover sheet, which you will get a PDF, so it should be attached. You should know how to do that. It shouldn't be too hard. If you can't do it sep uh, together, you can send the cover sheet separately, which would have your name on it, of course, in the class you're in, obviously in the work, the title of the work of art. Those cover sheets I'll send to you uh, in uh, two weeks, a week before the paper's due. And, uh, and then those are attached together in one file, preferably, sent to markw at aol.com, which I've been saying all semester is the only reliable way to submit work, any kind of assignment or extra credit. Okay, we've covered pretty much all the main requirements, but there are 
almost always more questions. Anybody have any questions right now that you feel you want to ask and you know, cl for clarification? Because of course, I can look at your papers. Not nobody's probably going to get started over labor. Well, maybe some of you are. I wouldn't have time to even think about it then, even if I have an internet connection up in rural Washington. But uh, I, I, I do encourage you to consider the idea of submitting part. Sometimes all you need is, is some feedback on a set one section, you know, or or even, you know, uh, a first draft. Uh, I'm willing to do that as long as you don't wait till the day or even 48 hours or less before it's due. Uh, but that gives you some extra, you know, kind of fact checking or correction. So you could do it that way. And then you would end up hearing from me saying, okay, good on this, that, and but missing X, Y, or Z. Um, <clears throat> okay, because that's that's an extra helpful, I hope, uh, step you could take. But a lot of people learn A, papers don't need to if they just follow these directions. If you turn it in late, it's five points off, unless it's a week or more late, and then it's 10 points off, which is a whole letter grade. So you don't want to do that to yourself if you could avoid it. Okay, any questions now before we switch to the first slide, which is a really interesting slide, the wedding portrait. One more time, any questions on what we covered on the papers? Okay, let's do the screen share now. And let's get this uh, first. We'll do the hide the thumbnail thing and then, okay, and move this out of the way. Okay. This is a really important slide. I am definitely not cutting it from the study list, which means, remember what I said this a couple of times already, so I won't keep repeating it, that it um, is going to be, right, uh, highly probable, I won't say certain, but likely, highly likely that it would could be on the midterm. Okay, so if you go back to week two, we skipped over because there was too much to cover in just the last 10 minutes on the Wednesday lecture. Okay, so this is at the middle of week two, and then we're gonna go forward, of course, with uh, the next uh, set of slides for week three, all right? So the title of this is Wedding Portrait. That's it, just two words. Now, in Stockstead, I think she puts the full title. It's like seven words long. I do try to give my students a break on things like titles uh, to keep them shorter, as well as definitions. So Wedding Portrait, and the artist's last name well, here we give you his first name. Why? Because he had a brother. Remember, we covered this if you were in class or watched the video of the Wednesday lecture on uh, early Renaissance art. Uh, Jan and Hubert together did lots of paintings, but Hubert had been dead for a couple of years. By the time this was done, only Jan was alive. So you got to, if it's on the exam, you, if you want to get credit on the answer to identify this, you would need the full name of the artist. It's Jan or Jan, J-A-N, last name Van Eyck. Of course, capital V A N and capital E Y C K. 1434. I'm imagining most of you have seen this at some point in your lives. If you've seen any had any interest in painting from you know the Renaissance or even just in general, it's so famous. And there are several reasons why. But I'm going to start with asking, usually about once a year, I get a student say, Yeah, has any of you seen this? It's at the National Gallery in London. Has anybody here seen this painting? Who's been to London? Oh, okay. It'll surprise the heck out of you because I have been teaching this course for years when I went to London my last trip in 04 and I had never seen this painting before that. And it's tiny, it's smaller than the Mona Lisa which is also surprisingly small. How the artist got this much detail, no one knows for sure. So that's one of the main things about it. But you know, that's not a fact about the meaning. It's just something to be aware of. So let's get to the facts about what, what are we looking at under meaning? Remember, always start the, the notes for every slide in this class with the meaning section. Okay, well, it depicts a wedding in a man's house in Belgium, which now the country, it wasn't then, but today it would be the country of Belgium of two people who were Italian immigrants. In other words, they were, you know, right? Not citizens of Belgium. The man was a wealthy merchant. You can probably tell by his clothing. And look at that hat. If that isn't the biggest hat in the history of painting, I don't know what it is. They sell copies of it in a gift shop in the same town. The house, by the way, you don't have to write this down. 
that they were married in is still there in Bruges, B-R-U-G-E-S. You don't have to write this, but if you ever go to Belgium, you won't forget that town. The whole town is a museum, a living museum. It hasn't changed since the you know, early Renaissance or late Middle Ages. It's a remarkable, beautiful city full of canals. It's just fantastic. That's where they were. So uh, get back to the parts you need to write now is this uh, depicts a wedding that occurred in the house of a wealthy Italian merchant. His name was Arnold Feeney. You should probably write that Arnold Feeney, A-R-N-O-L. F-I-N-I, -I, Arnold Fini. And then his wife was also Italian. I can't remember her last name, but of course it soon became his, right? So they are either acting or conduct, sorry, I should say conducting the wedding ceremony in his house or reenacting. That's the, one of the debates over the meaning of this. Is this a depiction of the wedding as it occurred in real time? Or is it a reenactment? Well, in a way, that detail is almost a moot question because the painting wasn't finished for months, of course, after the wedding. So what we can say with no fear of contradiction are these facts. It's all part of the meeting now. First of all, let's actually, wait a minute, I'm going to go closer now. Let's get, a, I have several close-ups. You see the mirror there? You notice there are figures in the mirror. That's the couple we see, right? You know, the bride with her, right? Uh, lace headdress and him with his big felt. And it's a felt hat, by the way, <laughs> the, the husband. Uh, and then I've got an even, I think I've got one more close up. Yeah, let's get up to this. This inscription says, okay, Jan van Eyck was here 1434. And that's him and the priest conducting the ceremony reflected in the mirror. It's a fascinating detail. I didn't even know that until I started teaching this course. I mean, I studied this painting at some point, but for whatever reason, I either didn't remember or never was told that. That mirror reflects the moment in which the wedding occurred. So now historians, almost all historians, just say most historians, agree that this is, was an actual ceremony that was conducted in that house with these two witnesses one of whom was the most famous painter in, in Belgium at the time, right? And so he, of course, was asked, right, commissioned is a better word, commissioned uh, by the husband who paid him, of course, to do a portrait of their wedding ceremony. Let's go back to the full view. Okay, and then we have a couple of other uncertain facts. I bet some of you already thought of a couple. Um, and that is some of the symbolism in the room. The oranges... Right on the windowsill and the dresser are symbolic of two things, one or both, probably both. One is that they had to be wealthy because uh, oranges don't grow in Belgium. <laughs> it's not the last time I checked. So he had to have them imported somehow, or maybe a small orange, you know, plant tree, whatever. In any case, they indicate wealth. You had to be wealthy to afford oranges. Hardly anybody who wasn't rich could afford them to buy and eat oranges. So that's a sign of wealth, but it also has a second possible meaning, fertility. But we don't have to guess that the bed very prominently displayed there indicates the future fertility of this couple. They will have healthy children in their future family life. Okay, another symbol is the, the um, I was gonna say bare feet, that's not quite right. You could say stocking feet. The shoes are off, both his shoes, those are his, and those are hers. That indicates that they are both standing on holy ground because after all, if a wedding ceremony is being held and there's a priest conducting it, that would make this quote a holy space during the, at least the time of the wedding ceremony. Um, it's not in a church, but you know, I got married in a house I was renting at the time. A lot of people I know do. Um, and they did it back then too. So this wedding ceremony, many, just again, say most historians believe was conducted in the house and there's more evidence because of the way the shoes are painted by Van Eyck as being off their feet. So it indicates they know that while the wedding's happening, this is holy ground. God's spirit is there. The dog is symbolic of fidelity. <laughs> I love that dog. That's one of the funnier faces of any dog. <laughs> I'm sure it's accurate. I'm, I'm guessing it was one of them owned it before the ceremony. 
Um, so dogs in painting and Renaissance paintings symbolize, symbolize uh, fidelity, the future faithfulness between the married couple. Uh, okay, and then we have another symbol of God's, let's get up close to, yeah, God's spirit being in the room. Remember the extinguished candle from last lecture? If you didn't see that lecture, you want to, the one about uh, the Marode altarpiece where there was candles that were blown out by what? The Holy Spirit, God's spirit. In other words, just say God's spirit is in the room. That's symbolized by extinguished candles. And there's several of them here. This candle and that one are not burning. They've been extinguished. The one candle still is. Okay, so that symbolizes God's spirit being in the room. And then we have a mystery of history. Anybody notice something? about her and the way she's standing. Now, I'm sure some of you have thought of this or noticed. Yeah, she looks pregnant to me. Yeah, that's a good guess. And for years, I thought so too. Turns out, no. Here's why we know she wasn't pregnant, even though she does seem to be at first glance, understandably. So this is an important part of the meeting here. If it's on the midterm, you'd want to get this part included in your answer, the part of your answer on the meaning of this slide. Here's why we know she almost, just say almost certainly, like yeah, 95% certain that she wasn't pregnant. First of all, they were guests in a foreign country and he was a businessman, an importer. His reputation was dependent on his behavior. And if he was marrying a woman who was so far along pregnant before they married that she was showing walking on the streets of that town would have ruined that couple's reputation and probably his business. So there's three reasons why almost all his, now this one you can say almost all art historians agree that she wasn't pregnant. So that's the first reason. It would have not been acceptable for her to wait that late to get married and be showing before they even had the ceremony. It would have ruined both their reputation and particularly his business reputation. Okay, another reason is that this is a common pose for women of all ages, even younger women in their you know, early puberty, but certainly elderly women who are clearly not pregnant. Some of them are 70 or 80 years old that are, were painted as portraits, you know, usually wealthy, of course, women from wealthy families. They're, she's holding her dress up so she could walk across the floor to hold his hand. By the way, I forgot to say the hands being held, that's symbolic of uh, him being, uh, I'm sorry, I misspoke. Her hand in his is symbolic of her obedience. Now, this was way before there was any kind of equality for men and women. Um, there were exceptions, of course, women who were able to make their own way and ignore those limitations, but not very many. So she's literally pledging with her open palm in his hand, I will be faithful and obedient to you, which is part of the wedding uh, vows they would have had. And his hand raise is symbolic of him saying, I will always remain faithful to you. So we know this isn't Bill and Hillary Clinton. Anyway, so what you have here is a couple that we can tag. We know who they are. And we know that often women are paid. So the second reason that we, uh, almost every historian agrees is she's not pregnant, is that women held their dress that way. I think you'll see one or two slides later, probably on Wednesday, where you'll see women that are clearly past the age, childbearing age, and who are holding their dress just the same way. So that isn't an indication one way or the other. But the final reason is we know when their children were born and they weren't born you know, a few months after they got married, but you know, whatever, I don't know, nine months or so afterwards and the timing of the first birth of their live birth of their family, of their children, I mean, for their family is, it wouldn't be consistent with her being um, pregnant. But there are some who still insist she might've been, and I don't know, maybe it, they were just uh, ignoring social conventions, but it doesn't jive with what other facts I just mentioned. So, okay, that's that's pretty much the whole meaning, okay? Now, formal analysis, it's balanced roughly, although his hat is so big, right? Somehow, because her dress, you see that, his feet and her, it bounces. If you did the area covered square inches, whatever, by her figure, right, of her entire body from head to foot and his, it, they're roughly equal and they're spaced evenly apart. So it's roughly balanced. Obviously, the window and wall and dresser roughly balance the bed here, and then the mirror and uh, and it is a uh, chandelier, kind of a chandelier, right? And uh, you can say light fixture and the mirror 
uh, and the dog are lined up in the middle. So it's roughly balanced. The rhythm should be obvious with, of course, their hands, heads, uh, you know, the parts of the furniture, the, the, obviously the uh, chandelier, repeated shapes, even the mirror has, right? The decorative patterns are repeated and the floorboards. And then that leads to the most important fact. Remember I said, this is one of the facts you could uh, overlap between meaning and formal analysis with the Van Eyck's. They were the first artist in, and then of course now it's just the brother Jan to uh, master or, or you know, develop whatever you can, not develop, it sounds like they invented, to, to learn, there we go, to learn the technique of scientific perspective. Well, they used it in all their later paintings and then after Hubert died, Jan always used it from then till his death. So these floorboards are the diagonals and they would all meet right behind at a common vanishing point past the mirror if there was a horizon. There's no question that this was scientific perspective. They even wrote about this, about using that technique and learning it from Italian Renaissance painters. Okay, so the scientific perspective for space, there is obviously overlapping, almost all works of art have that, uh, where they, you know, their clothes overlap their bodies, they overlap the background and so forth. Uh, and then we have diminishing size. Oh, absolutely. Things get smaller, the floorboards, right? Uh, and the furniture as it recedes. And then we have um, foreshortening is very strong here and very realistic, right? On the window, on the bed, on the floor. Um, and uh, let's see, there's no atmospheric perspective and there's no uh, register line. Okay. Um, and then we have thin line on all the objects. There's no bold lines. The cement texture, they were masters in both Van Eyck's. You could just say, of course, now it's just Jan that we're talking about. We're masters at super sharp, realistic cement texture. I would even say photo, you could write this in if it's either you chose to write a paper about this or you might be writing about it on your midterm um, that, that, that you'd want to mention. They, you could use the phrase photorealism because they're so sharp and realistic that it almost looks like it could have been taken from a photo, the painting itself. But of course, there were no photos that far back. So just say very sharp or realistic cement textures on the hair, uh, more so on the skin, you don't see as much of their hair, but you definitely do see it on the clothing, the floorboards, the furniture, everywhere. The colors, well, it's a mixture. Now he almost looks like a, he has a purple robe on here, but it's, it's really kind of a brownish color for some reason. Let, you know what, I'm gonna, I'm gonna go back because I have one more view of it here. No, that's no different. I'm not sure how each person's monitor, you know, it does vary from one monitor. And I give you flexibility. If, if the print you print out doesn't show, I've seen the real painting and better printed, you know, in, well, Stockstad, for instance, images of the actual original colors. His robes are brown. That's a warm color. Hers are green. So that's a cool color. Obviously his black hat is neutral. You get the idea her head, white headdress is cool. The bed, uh, and one, whatever that chair, I guess it is, behind them, obviously, and, and also the floorboards are all warm colors. So it's a chandelier, the wall is a cool gray, the walls on both sides. So it's a mixture. Uh, and then we have the modeling course, usually combined in a Renaissance painting, if it's a really sharp, realistic. So you have textures, you would also have, again, sharp, realistic modeling around their faces, on the bed, uh, right? Uh, in, you know, on the walls, around the window, everywhere you look, there's really sharp, strong modeling. The largest mass, it's, it, it's a close call between him because he's taller and his hat's so big. Maybe she is slightly larger if you count the bottom folds of her dress. Uh, and then after the two of them, whichever you think is the largest, or you could say they're about equal, would be the bed and then probably the floorboards. Okay, uh, is it stable or dynamic? Look carefully. It is mostly stable. His hat is dynamic as is the mirror on the back wall. But uh, the fact that the floorboards are create diagonals is just a function of the scientific perspective. The objects are almost, they're standing upright, totally upright, right? And her arms are almost, not quite, but almost at a right angle, certainly this one is. The bed is definitely almost all stable. Not the chandelier maybe, but even the, the, the um, whatever that is, the, the cable it's hanging from, uh, and the walls, the windows, it's more stable than dynamic, but there are dynamic details. Okay, now we're going to stop, share, and we're going to go, this takes a minute, just to pull up, hang on, I've done it a couple times, 
to get to uh, the uh, file for, here we go, the next uh, high Renaissance slides we're going to see now. And we're going to get probably to Da Vinci today. Pretty important, obviously. OK. Oh, that's for another I've done that before. Hang on. <laughs> okay. There you go. Renaissance, not realism. The two words do seem similar, but they're not. Okay. So let's go to um, this one. Oh, yeah. This is really important here. This is an important slide. I'm not cutting it from the study list, but I have to hit uh, screen share. So hang on and make sure you can see it before. All right. Okay, share screen, it should do it, hit, hit it again, whoops, it should do it. it, says I'm sharing screen, can everybody see this? Yes? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I can see it. Good, yeah, good, because we've got at least two slides here, we'll probably go to about 418 since we started at uh, 303, that's about right. Okay, this is a really important slide, again, I'm giving you a little heads up, it won't be cut from the study list. It's called Holy Trinity by Masaccio, and that's M-A-S-A-C-C-I-O. Some people say Masaccio, but uh, it doesn't matter how you pronounce it, it's how you spell it. It's on your syllabus, so of course you'll have that to look at when if it's on the midterm. Date, 1425. Okay, the first fact we, you should put in the meaning is that this is the first known example of scientific painting, sorry, scientific perspective being used in a painting. It's the first known example of scientific perspective being used in a painting. And it was an invention of the Italian Renaissance. I've already mentioned that. So here we have in this particular painting, same year as a Marot altarpiece. Remember we covered that on Wednesday of last week and that did not, have, they didn't know how to even, the, Van Eyck's and he had learned it. it. Took him several years to get that technique by studying Italian painting. So Italy and Italian Renaissance, the Italian Renaissance and the Italian painters of the early Renaissance invented scientific perspective. We know it uses it because it's been x-rayed. It's a fresco. The second fact about the meaning is where is it? It's a fresco on the wall of a church in uh, Florence, Italy, of course, yeah. Uh, and Masaccio, therefore, many history, just to keep it simple, many historians consider him the first artist to uh, master, right, or learn the technique of scientific perspective. Did he invent it? That's a matter of debate. There's no copyright or patent or anything, so we can't say for sure who invented scientific perspective. Well, we can say he's the first documented painter to use it, and this is the first painting in which he used it. Uh, there are diagonal lines that go from the bottom of the stairs, right, and would meet below the feet of Jesus on the cross. And then these lines, see, they're actually in the ceiling here. But we, it's been x-rayed, so we know that they're, they were uh, drawn onto the plaster of the wall. They would meet here. If you do those lines back, they would all meet, you know, again, just below the feet of Jesus on the cross. So what is this scene? That's the next thing to say about the uh, meaning, of course. Well, it shows the crucifixion of Jesus, but the other figures are equally important in this one. That's God, his father. So when you say Holy Trinity, that, that, that always means, according to the Catholic Church, and these Renaissance paintings always, if they, if they had all three of the holiest figures to the Catholic Church, they would always be these three figures. Jesus, God, his father in heaven, and the Holy Spirit. Well, where's the Holy Spirit? It's around God's neck. It almost looks like a collar, doesn't it? It's supposed to be a bird flying not very much distance, is it, from heaven down to earth to bring Jesus's soul as he dies back up to heaven to be with his father, God, in heaven. You can keep it simple and just say the three main figures, holiest figures of the Catholic Church are in this painting. It's why it's called the Holy Trinity, God, Jesus, and the Holy Spirit which you don't have to get detailed about, but that's actually symbolized as a white dove in this painting. Okay, and then these two figures aren't important at all. These are the donors. They paid for the painting, so they got their, their uh, images immortalized. 600 years later, we're still talking about them. But uh, they, someone knows their name, but we don't need to. Okay, and then this is Mary, mother of Jesus, 
the robes may look purplish here, but they're supposed to be, they're faded from, from a purplish blue. And of course, blue and purple and shades of blue and purple are considered the colors of royalty. So she's the queen of heaven and here she is. She's a saint, of course, so she has a halo. And then this here is one of the early disciples of Jesus. We don't know which one. Watching as Jesus dies, of course, on the cross. Okay, so that's pretty much the whole meaning, except for what? There's one other fact before we do a formal analysis. And that is that Masaccio also pioneered, you can't say developed because that implies they invented. So pioneered a technique of clothed, two words, nudes. That sounds odd, doesn't it? What, huh? Clothed nudes, that's a contradiction, an oxymoron. No, what that means is that he used a technique in which um, his models were posing nude. He'd paint them first as they appear in his studio, of course, nude, and then he'd paint the clothes on them. It might be obvious with Jesus, because this was a nude model that stood, uh, well, that must have been painful for hours. You know, he didn't actually have his hands nailed, I'm sure that wouldn't be going too far, but certainly in an awkward and painful position to pose for this scene for hours and hours, who knows how many days. Uh, and then he was nude at the time. So then Masashio came back after he finished this section of painting and added the loincloth. But suppose he did that with every other figure. So whoever posed for God and, and uh, Mary and this disciple, um, they would have been in the nude. Now, I don't know if he asked the donors to do that. <laughs> Excuse me, the first time I ever thought of that. They might have been an exception, but the main figure, just keep it simple, the main figures in Masaccio's paintings uh, were, were originally painted in the nude so he could get the volume and mass of their body, you know, muscles and everything correct. And then he painted the clothes over. That's called clothed with an ED nude. Okay, there's plenty on the meaning. Let's do a formal analysis. Well, I think it's obvious it's balanced, right? God and Jesus are right down the middle. You've got two figures here on the bottom steps, two on the upper step. Uh, the, the wall around them is completely symmetrical. It's just totally balanced. Um, and I would say top to bottom, but if you count human figures as having more mass than the ceiling, and if, it, if it feels that way to you, I wouldn't argue with that. So if you think of it that way, the number of human bodies or figures, then you could say it's, it's unbalanced toward the bottom if you do the line here, right, from the arms of the cross. Uh, I, I leave you to be, decide on that one. To me, it's roughly balanced because this ceiling is massive, as are, is the arch and the tops of the columns. Okay, for space, we have, I already said, scientific perspective, but we also have foreshortening, of course, on the ceiling, mostly, right? Uh, and then we have uh, diminishing size, yes, on these panels, these recessed panels here on the ceiling, which most Renaissance churches had that kind of ceiling, right? Um, and so those, you know, details, at least in that part of the painting, get smaller, and, and that's called diminishing size. And let's see, do we have, oh, of course, overlapping, obviously. There is no atmospheric perspective. And you might think register line. You know, I wouldn't argue with that. It, you, so someone wrote that, I forgot, but a couple of semesters back and said, well, what these figures are closer to us and they're on the bottom line and you can see the tops of the stairs. If that was a separate line that the artist painted, drew whatever, before he finished the painting and then painted over, you could make the case that there is a register line here. Register, that's without a D, right? Okay, but no atmospheric perspective. Well, colors are a mixture of warm and cool. Cool on Mary and one of the donors, warm on the disciple and the male donor, warm on Jesus's body. And God couldn't make up his mind that day. His robes are a mixture of warm and cool. It's like half and half. And of course, the building behind them is a mixture of warm, kind of almost salmon color, isn't it? On some of the, uh, the archway and some of the tops of the detailing of the of the wall, but then it's the, the actual columns, right? Uh, the flat imitations and real columns on either side are cool. There's strong simulated texture on the hair, the clothing, the architecture. That's a given, you can always count on that with the Renaissance paintings. It's the same is true for strong realistic modeling on the human figures, especially strong on Jesus's body, but it's also true on the robes of all the figures. Uh, and then the largest mass, I would say it's the ceiling or the upper part of this, you know, recess here. Uh, and then it's a close call, but probably Jesus's body because you can see all of his body. And then it, it, perhaps the uh, 
Mary and the other few, because these two donors are kneeling. Remember, you only have to give the three largest masses. Okay, and it is mostly stable. The only things dynamic are the arches, uh, sorry, arch and the ceiling, the archway, I meant to say, and the ceiling above them. Otherwise, the figures are almost at right angles, except maybe, you know, uh, God's arms are reaching down to his son, I guess. But the figures are upright, all of the human figures, and then even God is mostly upright. And the walls, just as the ceiling is, and some of the details are dynamic. Um, and let's see, I think we've got mostly modeling, mass, volume, balance. Oh, rhythm. Yeah, of course, it's the human bodies, the arms, legs, the heads, hands, and the ceiling and the uh, decorations on the archway. Okay, let's do uh, Donatello. This is really important too. I'm not going to cut this one. It's probably the last one we'll have time to do today. It's a really important one. Then we'll get to Da Vinci uh, uh, on Wednesday. So here we have David. One word, that's the title, David. Donatello is the artist, D-O-N-A-T-E-L-L-O, -L -L -O, 1428. There's a lot to say about this and I'll try to keep it just the highlights, but it, it's a really important um, sculpture for several reasons. Let's start with the first one, that it is the first freestanding, I'll say it slowly and repeat it, the first freestanding life-size figure done in Europe, you have to say Europe, done in Europe since classical or ancient times. In other words, the Romans and the Greeks knew how to make their, of course, their sculpture would be freestanding, right? You've seen plenty of Greek and Roman statues at some point in your life, photos of them, I mean. But in the Middle Ages, the European uh, artists didn't know how to make their statues freestanding. They had to have them against a wall or a column or some kind of a tree branch or something supporting them. So I'll say it again. This is the first freestanding life-size figure in European art since ancient Roman times, you could say, in over a thousand years. That's a major right uh, advance, right? That makes this a seminal work of art. I've been using that word, I think I have, but if not, you'll hear a lot more from now on. It's a work of art that changes the, you know, that medium or that type of art from then on. It led to many other artists doing that, learning how to make their figure standing. It's also in contraposto. So here's a definition. This is the first one for today. If I didn't put it on here, I should have. Well, it, no, it's not a definition. So it's just for this slide. But if it's on the exam, you'd want to know this. Contrapposto is a pose for sculpture. I, I will say it slowly and repeat it because it's an important part of the meaning of this slide. It's a pose for sculpture. I'm sorry, could you spell it too? Uh-huh, yes, I apologize. Yes, I should. Uh, of course, you won't be uh, have parts taken off if you misspell, but since it's not, uh, good point. It's not on the handout. Contrapposto, C O N. T R A P P O S T O C O N T R A P P O S T O. Uh, one of my students said, "You mean it's kind of pasta made in Contra Costa County?" No, the first word is the same as Contra, as in Espanol, right? Or that county called Contra Costa. It's one word with two P's in the middle. It's, it's a long Italian word. If you don't get it exactly spelled right, it, it will be no points off. The only spelling you have points off for or misspelling is, is the, the words that are on the syllabus, just the titles and the artist's name. Okay, so it's contrapposto. All right, let me now define that. It's a pose for sculpture with three features. One, okay, the weight is on the front leg. No, I'm sorry, I misspoke. I already misspoke. I had it right. Here we see where the arrow is. It's hard to see in this image of it. Yeah. But you, he's standing on his back leg. So I'll say it again. Number one feature, I'll repeat the whole thing once when I'm finished, is the weight is on the back leg and the front leg is loose. You can see that. He's not putting his weight on the front leg. It's not left or right. Don't, that's totally wrong. It's, Front and back, I'll say again, the weight is on the back leg and the front leg is loose, okay? Number two, one arm is down 
and the other is raised, usually holding something. Well, if you get up close, you can see he's holding the rock he used to kill Goliath. We haven't gotten to the meaning yet, but this is a really important part of the meaning. Uh, so it's the second fact. First is, you know, how ahead of its time it was with the, you know, freestanding pose. And then the pose itself is part of the meaning, remember, as well as overlaps into the formal analysis, which we'll do and before we wrap up. Okay, so the second, again, feature for contrapposto is that one arm is down and the other is raised, usually holding something. In this case, both arms are holding something, but this arm is obviously higher than the other. And the third feature is the spine forms a gentle S curve. The spine forms a gentle S curve. It's the way human beings actually stand when they're relaxed. It's the way human beings naturally uh, are, po are posed when they're not, you know, in action or in motion. They're relaxing. And the Romans and the Greeks, if the Greeks discovered it, it's the Greek idea. And then the Romans copied the Greeks. So for thousands of years or so, ancient Greece and Rome, they knew how to do this pose, contrapposto. That was lost during the Middle Ages to all the European sculptors until this guy rediscovered it. Probably looked at small Greek and Roman sculptures and figured it out. There's a couple other facts. I think everyone knows the story of David, but I guess not everybody. It's a really important part of the meaning, right? The, the, the young Jewish shepherd boy that killed Goliath, the giant enemy soldier who, who was, you know, uh, challenging him to a life or death battle. He had one chance to kill Goliath with a slingshot and he just did it. We know he's just one because he's standing on the head of Goliath. He severed with that sword Goliath's head. So this is after the battle or after the victory of, Goli of uh, David over Goliath. And he's holding the sword he used to cut the head off and the rock he had uh, used for his slingshot to kill Goliath. So those are the details there. And this is a story from the Bible, right? As most of you know. All right. And then another fact is that this sculptor was openly gay at a time when that was not only and not acceptable to the authorities, but it was against the law, as it, it still is in some parts of the world. But in any case, then it was all over Europe and probably everywhere else. Uh, but certainly in Europe, it was against the law. How did he get away with that? This model was one of his lovers. The evidence is very strong. I'll just say again, many or most, actually, sorry, most historians believe this. This model was one of his lovers. He certainly he lived with, with uh, the artist Donatello. It's because Donatello was the first great Renaissance sculptor. That's the last fact about the meaning. The fact that he was gay and got away and didn't didn't get punished for it. Let's put it that way. You know, got away with sounds kind of judgmental. I don't mean it that way. I mean, you know, he wasn't punished for it. He could be openly gay and and. It was an open secret. I mean, maybe the public didn't know, but uh, almost all of the other artists and the, the Catholic officials, they knew. And the city officials in Florence, they knew and they overlooked it because he was the first great Renaissance sculptor. And they commissioned this last fact now about the meaning. They commissioned this piece, the city government of Florence, commissioned this piece to send a political message, which is why it was displayed in a public place. That message was to Milan. Now, if you know, Milan's a big, big city. Florence is not a big city. So Milan was their enemy, big city, like Goliath was bigger than David. So what the message of this uh, piece was, why the city government of Florence commissioned it, was to send a message to Milan to say, if you attack us, we'll do to you what David did to Goliath period. So if you attack us, we will do the same thing to you that David did to Goliath. It's a pretty strong message, and it seemed to work because Milan never did attack Florence. Well, not until much, much later, like decades later. But who knows? In any case, it was shown in public, in a public square, uh, as soon as it was finished, uh, because the city had paid for it. So you could see why they wouldn't punish the artist who created this image. Um, so he was able to have rather well, just say, when you say open that, what does that mean? Just the well-known uh, gay lifestyle and he wasn't punished for it. It's a very rare occurrence in the Renaissance, but he was so important that they overlooked it. Okay, let's wrap it up with a formal analysis. It's a neutral color because it's black colored bronze. The textures are both the real smooth texture of the bronze, of course, itself, and the semi texture, yes, those are flowers on his hat, 
on his hat, his hair, his muscles, uh, and Goliath's head. Uh, really good Sumerian texture created with carved line, of course, as always with sculpture. And then we have the modeling is just the lighting from the museum. Uh, there are several masses, really basically four. There's the largest mass is his body, David's body, then the sword, or it's a close call, but probably the sword because it's so long, and then the head of Goliath, and then the stone, or maybe it's a hat. Yeah, I guess it'd be the hat. But you can only have to list the three largest pieces, parts of a piece. Is it balanced? Oh, well, it has to be. It's, it's a human figure standing upright, uh, but top to bottom, it's an intact human body. So of course, it's going to also have the rhythm of the arms, legs, hands, uh, his hair, right? Uh, and, and the armor and the uh, flowers on the heads of Goliath and David. So there's lots of rhythm and it is both stable dynamic. He's standing upright, but, he, but the S curve that the pose automatically imposes on a, a figure, on any piece of sculpture makes a slight S curve. That means it's slightly dynamic. Uh, but because his arms are out at a diagonal, you could say it's more dynamic than stable, but his upper body is pretty upright. Overall, mostly upright is in his head. So it's a mixture. Okay, uh, and then what are we missing? Rhythm, balance, um, I think that, oh, for space, it's a real three-dimensional figure, about six feet tall, including the, the base, uh, with overlapping of the hands over the sword and the rock and uh, the feet over the head of Goliath. Okay, that's it. We got exactly the amount of time we should have. Any questions? I stick around as always after the lecture's done. Um, does anybody have any questions that you want me to answer about what we've covered today? Uh, or going back to when we reviewed the requirements for your paper. I'm not gonna restate them because that's in the video. If you joined us late, you can watch that uh, after I post it on YouTube. Um, but anyway, I have a question. Sure, please, go ahead. Uh, can you repeat about the Holy Trinity, about Masacho? It was the first example of what? Oh, yes, it was, sure. The first example, uh, the no known, here we go, the first known painting to use scientific perspective, period. The first known painting. You could say the first painting we know of that used, but I'm trying to keep it brief, you know. So the first painting where we know for sure the, the artists are used scientific perspective. It was, you know, um, if you remember the slide, you were here right for that, is the stairs, you know, if you do a line, the stairs, they re reach, you know, diagonal lines reach up towards the cross that Jesus was on. And then ceiling, uh, the, the patterns in the ceiling do the same. So yes, we know that that uh, artist used diagonal lines with a common vanishing point. In other words, he used scientific perspective and he's the first painter we know of that did that. Okay, any other questions? Uh, I do on the David uh, on the modeling. What did you say the modeling was? Oh yeah, it's a it's you almost could just ignore that if it's on the exam. But if you're writing a paper, you would want to cover all nine elements. There is no technique for modeling with sculpture. It's the shadows created or the lighting you can say by the lighting of the museum. It's in a museum in Florence, the same museum that David is in. It's a pretty major museum. If you ever get to Italy and you hopefully you'll go to Florence. Don't try to spend one day. You just can't see all the great art. There. This museum alone is worth it. Yeah, it's it's just the museum's lighting that creates the modeling. Okay. Yeah, there's no technique for modeling. Okay. I have a question about the rhythm. Could you yes. just repeat uh, the rhythm? Sure. Yeah, well, it's a, a, an attack human body. So there's the two legs, two arms, two hands. I would even say his uh, ha uh, braids, are those braids, what do you call them, right? His hair, he had long hair, the model had long hair. And there's even rhythm on the decorations of Goliath's helmet and the flowers, right? Those are flowers in David's hat. So there's a lot of rhythm here, you know, as there is with any intact human body, yeah. And his face too, you know. But okay, good questions. Anybody else? I actually have another question. Sure, go ahead. Um, I have a hard time to to do the meaning. Would there is there, there is, um, are there any handout for the meaning? No, the meaning is what you have to take from the lecture while you you know hear the lecture or <laughs> both. You could do that and look it up in the textbook because this is in Stockstead. Or you can uh, you could do all three if you if you really need to. Uh, you can um, you know replay the video and pause it <laughs> on this slide if you missed it. 
Yeah, because there was a lot to say about the meaning of this, but I try, I, my daughter's in one of my uh, observing, just observing as assisted for me, since she's already taking other classes online at the JC at Santa Rosa. So she drives all the way up there with me, right? And she's been observing. She said, you're doing a little better. I hope your students notice on trying to say things slowly and repeating them once. But I can, of course, do that three or four times or we'd never get through the semester. So I understand if you're not used to taking notes in a class like this, it, it, it might be a little bit, you know, difficult to get everything on paper. So you have several options. You can go back and replay this once it's posted on YouTube. You can double check with Stockstead because some of the same parts of the meaning are in there. Uh, or you, of course, if you happen to know someone else who is now in or ever took our 2.1 from me, then they would have the notes of this. Um, but do you have any specific questions about one part or two? No, it was just like uh, when I uh, when I have the, when I when I'm facing something that I have to to do the meeting, I think I'll have a hard time. But the the YouTube classes are going to be really helpful. Yeah, I can, put, I, I can put the captions and everything. Big so advantage of Zoom class. Yeah. I know, and I think that's plus it's an open book test. Remember that. Okay. Open, oh. yeah. The midterm and the final book. Okay. Any other questions? Because of course, that's what is my these now of minutes are my unofficial office hours since I don't have an office or set time. But anybody else have any questions about anything we covered in either the slides or the uh, requirements for your papers? Okay, I always give it one more chance because sometimes people have to think about. And of course, you can always email me with any other question you may have. Don't forget, we have a lot to cover. You don't want to miss Wednesday's lecture. It will cover Da Vinci, Mona Lisa, and the uh, Last Supper. Very important slides that won't be cut from the study list, I'll tell you right now. Either one of those, not both, but one of them may well be on the list. Yeah, yeah I've I love that. seen them. They're so famous. But a lot of people don't understand the meaning of the Mona Lisa, or they have heard theories that are not valid or else dis in dispute. We're going to talk about that. Some of the theories about why is she smiling, and you know why did Da Vinci paint her that way. We'll talk about all that on Wednesday. So you want to be here for that whole class. Okay. Any other questions about anything we've covered? Anything what is the with? what is the the first uh, paper due? Short research three, paper due. Three weeks from today. It's week six, and I accept them up till midnight of that day before they're counted late. So that gives you, uh, you know, the chance to ask questions over the next two weeks or to send me a sample of what you've written as long as you don't wait till less than 48 hours before it's due. So that would be three weeks from today, uh, which is, uh, let me see, I have to look it up. <laughs> I think it's the 20, oh, it's on here. Is the 20? Uh, yeah, yeah, the 20. Yeah. Uh, actually, um, I give you till the 22nd because that's a Wednesday. So you have a little time to ask questions on the Monday that week in case you're down to the last few things that you're not sure about. You can check with me on, you know, the, the class lecture time uh, or, or send me an email uh, at any point. But don't wait till the night or two before it's due. Yeah, so who knows it's due the 22nd. Yeah. So it's a little more than three weeks, actually. Yeah. Okay. Any other questions? All right. Uh, all right. I am going to now, let's see, pause the recording, stop the recording. Okay, anybody else? Last call. All right. I'll see you all on Wednesday at about 3.02.